there is definitely someone profiting off of chaos. Yeah. And so, being that Baku is such a rich, um, resourced uh, area with oil, and there's there's just so many geopolitical reasons why instability there mm-hmm. would be beneficial to you know other powers and other nations. Maybe that was a, a massacre that 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 was useful yeah. for what they were you know trying to accomplish. Yeah, it's it's really a cynical uh, move. I mean, it's like using uh, underlying ethnic and, and religious tensions to further some sort of political goal. Yeah. And and we see yeah. this in every nation state around the world. And we see it in the United States right now. Yeah. You know. That's what I was about to say. Yeah, and we I see that to, here, you yeah. know, playing on playing on um you know, finding a finding a scapegoat to to blame all the problems on and then delivering on a on a gold platter the solution or that scapegoat yeah and then just basically saying attack right there yeah i mean you're we're seeing that here and it that's what's so scary about it is that even what my family went through it began with words and sentiment and jokes and um the grooming like culture of, wars yeah, and stuff yeah, like the, that yeah yeah that and like the grooming of intolerance which seems mm. so uh, you know, ben- benign and just so casual and, oh, well, it's just, you know, that's, you know, it's just small talk or whatever. But what it does to us as human beings and how it, you know, touches on a spot, on, on a spot in our, on, in our primitive brain, I think, for survival and fear and mob rule and mob mm-hmm. mentality. I mean, it's, it's a tactic that works and that's why a lot of our poli- you know political leaders will use it throughout different times of history to accomplish a goal mm-hmm. um, and and we don't seem to learn from it because one there's the politics of denial which feeds that cycle if there's the politics of denial then we don't acknowledge what was done you know, to as an injustice to a group of people, mm-hmm. so then we don't take it accountability. So then it further, to, you know, grooms our intolerance towards that group, making it easier for us to dehumanize and um, victimize that group again. So the politics of denial is is right there happening at the same time as the dehumanizing of that population. It has mm-hmm. to happen like parallel. Mm-hmm. No, that's not what we're doing. You know, we're not dehumanizing them. Like they broke the law yeah like, right no we're not no that's the consequence that's what we do when people break the law you know well, so it's, it's just like justifying it it's like constantly. with the the uh de- 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 call, they call them detention centers but i i like to use the term concentration camps because i think that's more of a real accurate term we should call things what they are but that we see on the border um here in the united states and it is that process because it's like so if you go back so even just a few years ago, they weren't doing it at the scale they're doing it now necessarily or with the same kind of um, cruelty. I mean, it was still very cruel. I think what people need to understand this is a long-standing tradition. You know, previous presidencies and administrations have enacted similar measures. But under Trump, it's sort of a new level of dehumanization that's happening. And so, you know, you go back even a few years ago, people were using the same excuses to justify the dehumanization of these people trying to f- to leave uh, war torn or or wherever they're coming from from South or Central America, um, and um, and so now we're at a new level where I mean, all the information that's coming out from detention centers, these these camps, um, and people are still using the same kind of language to to that politics of denial. That's like, well, if only they did it this way or mm-hmm. this way or this way, and we wouldn't have to do this. But it's like the cruelty is is escalating and the same denial is being implemented to justify those actions. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, I imagine for you, I mean, for me, it's like, this is new. Like, this is a part of my my life. I haven't had these these experiences to draw upon in in previous experiences. So I think having your perspective, I know you've been pretty active in speaking up about that and doing what you can to draw attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. I... There's very little I could do about it, but I know that the biggest thing that I can do is one day answer my children, mm-hmm. what did you do about it? Yeah. 
And that to me is so much more important than, you know, anything else mm -hmm. is being able to face my own children. You know, we, we worship together. We, we uh, practice our faith together. Um, my children know the values of not just our culture, but our faith, our spirituality. And so if I am asking them to walk a certain walk, um, with the values I'm instilling in them, but then I don't demonstrate that as an adult to them. How can I look them straight in the face, in their eyes, and and feel a connection, you know? Feel an honest connection with them. Right. Uh, I can't do that. I, I, I don't know how other people can do that or if they do that, but I can't do that. If my children ask me, you know, what did you do when this was going on? Just like if it was during the Holocaust, you know, if someone would have asked their parent, well, what did you do? Yeah. How could you just stand there? Yeah. How could you not, how could you not be affected by it? Even if you can't do something, what did you do? Mm -hmm. Did you demonstrate? Um, did you say something? Did you write a letter? Did you vote a certain way? It's like the bare minimum. The, but what that, did you do? You know, yeah. yeah. Did you lose sleep about it? Did you hurt? Did you care? Um, I, I want to be able to answer my children in a very honest and real way and in a way where it aligns and reflects and reinforces our, our Christian beliefs, our spiritual beliefs, and our, val our values in our family and is in our culture. Yeah. So um, that I think that that's like what we talk about all the time as yeah. a society that mm -hmm. that's what we value as a society and um i hear christians talk about it that that's that we're we're called to you know be humanitarians and witness and live a christ-like life mm -hmm. i cannot imagine christ or any other prophet or um savior or any other religions um spiritual teacher and leader just kicking back and turning off the tv when that was going on or saying well they should have you know they should have followed the law i mean we're land of laws i mean right i i cannot imagine that i cannot imagine that like that i i don't know if that's the if that's the religious leader's response then i don't want to worship that god yeah you know, mm -hmm. there's uh, there's a, there's something I wrote in my book for my children, which I think is is how I'd like to you know guide them and raise them. And it says that it's in the beginning where it's the dedication, and it says you know what's what's ethical is not always legal, and what's legal is not always ethical. And my prayer is they do know the difference in their heart. And I feel like there's times in society, and there's times in our um, country, nation, world where we're stepped up to defend our, our human ethics above law. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's what we're called to do as human beings. If we need the law to tell us how to be human, we've, we've reached a very dangerous point. Yeah. If the laws is what um, keep us accountable to one another, keep us humane and ethical, like if it's only the law that keeps me ethical to you mm -hmm. and keeps me from like destroying your property and hurting your children, mm -hmm. then we've reached a, a very dangerous point in our society. There should be human ethical dignity, decency that that's led by the soul that is way before any law. 